Welcome to another episode of the Propaganda Show. My name is Chris Sarda. Uh, we have, it's just me today, we're going to do another, uh, one of these PBS sort of styled um, criticism reports. Uh, you can find me uh, on Twitter at Chris Sarda. Uh, today we're going to talk about The Vegetarian by Han Kang. It is a, the winner of the, the Man Booker International Prize, which is something, is a, one of the awards I follow. So, you know, it used to be the, just the translation prize. Um, they've been doing it for, for a while. Uh, but now it's switched uh, in general to the international. The, it's called now the, uh, the international prize. It used to be more about, more like what the, what the Nobel prizes have been, where you, you give it to an author for his body of work, not a specific work. And now starting this year, they started actually recognizing, uh, the best novel that's translated into the English language pretty much. And it, it's a good list. Um, this entire list is, is on my to read list. Of course, you know, if you're a reader, your to read list is always much longer than you're able to actually read and what you actually finish list. Uh, so I, I finished the vegetarian. The only other book on this list uh, was also very good. I don't know if I'll do one of these of it cause I read it months and months ago now is uh, the general theory of oblivion by Jose o o Eduardo, um, Agualusa. And that was a real good book too. Um, but the vegetarian is more fresh in my mind. I finished it a, a, about a month ago or so. Um, it is by Han Kang. Like I said, it won the Man Booker International Prize. Um, and we're going to get in today for this. We're going to get, you know, into like a, a pretty light synopsis. And then I just want to talk about some some themes and things that could be discussion topics uh, that uh, I'd want to cover and and you know, some criticism, basically what I think of it, not criticism in the sense that, that, uh, I'm going to say I like it or I don't like it. I'm going to pretty, if pretty much, if I'm doing one of these podcasts, uh, it made me think and made me want to, you know, write out and talk out and critically think about some of the, the issues, uh, within the book or, or the setting or, uh, the way it sits in society, all those really nerdy questions, basically, you know, this is very much not a pop podcast. Um, it's, uh, it's definitely something where, you know, maybe I'll get some, a second person in here, but then, you know, you, you have to mix it in that we're both ready to talk about some of the deep themes in film or, or books and stuff. And then we also have to have watched the same film or book or whatever, but for now, I'm just going to you know, just go off on, on my own with these. So you'll notice that there are a couple unnamed podcasts before this is before I really had a name for the podcast. Uh, we talked about a couple Oscar nominated movies, Manchester by the sea and fences. So go look at, go listen to those. If you're, if you're into that, um, if you have opinions about it, you can always go to at Chris Sarda. I don't think I'm going to run a, a Twitter, um, for the propaganda show. I think it's, it's going to be mostly, uh, me churning stuff out. Um, other than that, though, like not every show. My plan isn't to have every show on this podcast be, um, you know, this sort of armchair deep discussion, you know, one person discussion, but uh, at least a discussion topic list. Um, so the other plans for this podcast are going to be to basically, uh, basically follow the the MCU, which is the the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Um, I'm gonna just go from the top. Uh, I'll try to get some people in here with that, and I'm gonna I'm gonna try to get be in detail. I, that's probably where I don't see other people uh, doing it. They're not gonna go in detail with the comics and the shorts and stuff like that. So so a lot of you probably don't know that aside from the movies and the TV shows like shield and daredevil and, and then the movies like iron man and Avengers and whatnot. There are actually comic books that are part of the, uh, the cinematic universe. Nothing crazy happens. In them. And then there are like short films and stuff. And we're going to talk about how those work in. And I'm going to try to get those in a, 
in uh, a chronological release date order. Um, and and we'll see how that works. If I uh, bring other people in, we might you know some of them might be done alone, and then and then if I'm going to be doing like episode by episode talks, which I'd like to do, but that's a lot easier obviously to to do with a second person. It's a lot of work to do these alone, and, and obviously it takes a lot of practice to be able to talk that long. Um, so we'll see about that because that's going to be a little bit more fun where some of these are, are, I'm attempting theoretically trying to make them a little bit more deep. Uh, so we're going to be doing that. Then, uh, I'm going to be, do another one that's almost the same thing, except going to follow the, uh, the new Star Wars canon. I wish I had an old school Star Wars guy because what I'd love to do is, is, uh, sort of compare what they, they take and play with. Cause obviously I am a Star Wars guy, but I never, I never delved deep into the former canon. They got frozen when, uh, when Disney took over, you know, so I, I hear about it. I read it. I listen to a lot of the Star Wars podcasts and I hear them talk about it, uh, but, um, but I was never deep into it. Right. So like, for example, Thrawn is a character in the books in the expanded universe that everyone loved. He's recently moved over, uh, into the, uh, the, I forget what they call the new universe, but you know, the, the, the canon universe since Disney, Disney has taken over, you know, and that's a, that's a good conversation as we talk about what's happening in the canon, you know, and I don't exactly know I'm going to do that because I'm all over the canon, you know, the comic books were released at one point and the way I'm trying to collect them. And then I want it to be sort of a collector show too, because I am trying to like gather, you know, not, I'm not like hoping to finish or anything like that. Cause there's so much to buy and I'm not rich, but as I gather stuff, you know, from the star Wars canon, I'll probably start talking about it, you know? So that'll be a review of the stories, uh, of their place in, in the, the new star Wars canon. Uh, as you guys might know, the canon is like huge from comics and books and of course the films. So, um, enough about that. Uh, so Star Wars, Marvel, and then I think we're going to do, this is one I can do easier with, uh, with a group of guys, especially the, uh, the couple of friends or co-hosts I have on the sports podcast is going to be just a general movie thing. We're just going to read the movie news, talk about, uh, movies. These guys are more, probably more like big name film than they are, you know, Oscar nominated movies, but of course I'll still, I'll still work that in there. Just like I work some of my esoteric sports into the, into the chaotic sports podcast. So anyway, let's get into it. Uh, this podcast is about Han Kang's, uh, vegetarian. It's, uh, basically going to be, you know, out, outright talking about a few discussion topics and themes and criticism. Um, and just in general, me thinking out loud about, about the books I read. So we're going to start off with a synopsis, and then we're going to talk about a few few topics in the, uh, in the work. Okay, so the structure of The Vegetarian will be um, talked about in detail later, but basically, right off the bat, it's, it's three short stories, essentially. Um, it, the book itself is about, an, is like novella length, in my opinion, but... Uh, the, the short stories, I guess, were released as novellas at one point and then all brought together. So at the beginning, uh, the first one is, is uh, written through the eyes of, of the protagonist's uh, husband. And she, the whole story revolves around her decision at the very beginning of the book to become a vegetarian. Um, a real famous line is the very beginning of the book. I hear it. I hear it mentioned a lot, and either that means that reviewers are only reading the beginning of the book and then reading synopsis and pretend they read it, or it's a legitimate, it's a legitimate, interesting line um, for modern literature. And uh, it goes, before my wife turned vegetarian, I'd always thought of her as, com- as completely unremarkable in every way. I, I don't think it's meant to blow you away, but it sort of sets the tone for the book in general, and especially this narrator. So the wife becomes a vegetarian. Korean, uh, the Korean culture is one where meat is eaten a lot. Everyone's very surprised. She, he thinks it's very weird, although he does leave it alone at first. Uh, his chapter really comes to a head, uh, 
when he, when she embarrasses him at work, where people get really weirded out by the fact that she's very vegetarian and it makes him look bad. He's very shallow in the book. Um, I didn't notice it on my first read. I thought it was just her style of writing, and, and maybe that's just the way guys are. But he's very shallow in the book, um, very annoyed that he's he, he was made to look bad uh, in front of his work people. And then it really peaks when they're at... Um, uh, when they're at uh, Young Se, I'm always, I, I hate saying her name because I'm, I know I'm killing it. But when Young Se goes here, goes to, uh, they go to her um, parents to have a big dinner. And both parents are there. Um, and her sister and brother-in-law are there, who are the later narrators. And the the husband's already, or the the father is already extremely angry about it. He'd been told that she didn't eat meat, and and he thinks it's preposterous. And this is all ha- this happened on the phone earlier in the chapter. And when they finally get there, he gets disgusted. Has uh, the husband and and the brother in law hold her down, and he forces meat into her mouth, and she basically tries to kill herself. And they got to go take her uh, to the hospital, essentially. So it just. It just really takes a head. It gets intense, and um, it gets really weird. There's also, like, a real dry rape scene in that chapter. And when I read it, I, I can't say that, you know, if, if my wife were around, she doesn't like those scenes in movies, and it takes her by, you know, takes her by surprise, or it definitely gets a comment by her when she's reading the Game of Thrones books. There's a lot of, there are a lot of violent rape scenes in those books, and she, she was mentioning it, you know. But this is not, this the scene in that, in this chapter didn't have like a real punch to it is it was just told in a very dry fashion and and essentially the entire chap the entire book is told this way very passive very dry but you do get these you do get these build ups and when it does hit it hits and i would say that the the scene where the father starts force feeding her and she tries to kill herself is like this huge contrast in the chapter where you, where something's come to a head and you actually feel it. So, so this will be important later, but there's, uh, three big pieces of violence in here. It's that passive rape scene I just mentioned. Um, and the father, uh, holding her down or the husband holding her down while the father forces meat into her mouth. And, uh, and then she tries to commit suicide. So she's, uh, she's gone on the deep end on the vegetarian side. I think that people always want to mention vegetarianism here and, and that'll be a theme later, but really it's just what she's picked and she's, she's become extreme. Uh, you probably don't realize that she's crazy yet until she cuts her, her, her wrists or tries to kill herself. And then, you know, when that happens, you know that there's something wrong and it moves on to the next chapter and the next chapter is sort of, you know, it has this weird feel. There's not as much explicit violence in it, but it goes through the eyes of her brother-in-law. Now it's, it's a, it's a while down the line. Um, uh, the protagonist has, his her husband has left her. She's a little bit crazy. She's gotten out of, uh, the, the mental hospital. They think that she could, live on her own. And, and basically that's what she's doing. And the brother-in-law is now telling the story. He, he reviews, you know, he remembers what happened that night and stuff, but he starts to get like really enamored with her. And, uh, especially, especially with a birthmark, uh, that she has he starts thinking about it and he's an artist and he, you know, he tries to, he tries to figure out different ways that he can, he can work his art in with her and and show this mark he tries with an actor and it gets too erotic and and the the other actor slash artist gets angry and basically the whole time he's fantasizing about sleeping with her about being with her um and just completely focused on her and you know and basically talks a lot of crap about his wife in that chapter and it, it comes to a head where he does do, he ends up doing the art piece with her and then also ends up sleeping with her. The wife, uh, uh, the wife catches him, you know, with his, with her mentally ill sister, essentially. And, um, and he disappears. Now there's no, 
there's none of that explicit violence of the first chapter, but you know, there's a little piece in there where basically, you know, he's basically taking advantage of someone he knows is mentally ill. Um, but the the writing never makes her feel especially mentally ill. It makes her almost feel like a like she's protesting, you know. So then the third chapter is told it, through the eyes of of her sister. It's years down the road. She's divorced. Both are divorced essentially. There's no real mention of the husband anymore. Um, the the of uh, of young his husband. Um, but, uh, the narrator who is, uh, young, his sister, uh, she mentions her husband sort of talks about one time he called and, and, and talked about the kid, but really this chapter becomes incredibly internal. Uh, she's visiting, uh, she's visiting her sister in the mental hospital and her sister's gone to the next level, basically starts believing she's a tree, uh, doesn't want to. Uh, consume anything but water and sun and she's obviously she's dying from that obviously and uh there's a there's a really violent scene you know the rape is told passively and that's you know negative illegal uh against the law but then the scene where they they force feed her and she's trying to reject them and it's it's doctors force feeding her is is ex- written extremely violently so there's a little bit contrast There, you know, there's something that's, you know, in in regular life, there's something that's necessary. And then you have, you know, a rape scene that's, that's written very passively in the first chapter, but all violent. Um, this book isn't violent, like, you know, a Mortal Kombat video game, but the, there is a definite focus on it. And, and that thing will be discussed here. So, um, that's the gist of the synopsis. I don't want to get too deep in it. If you're listening to this, you probably read the book, um, if you're not, thanks for listening, but, you know, the book is going to be, the book is, tells it the way it wants to, so that should be the first step. So some of the things I want to talk about here, um, so before we get into the deep themes, there's the, there's the, the issue of the translation. So it won the Man Booker International Prize, and so actually the author wins some money, and then it's uh, also... Uh, some money is also given to the translator and theoretically from our point of view or the man booker's point of view, which is, you know, basically the best book translated into English, you'll have, you'll have something, you'll have a work that needs to be great on its own, right? Translating to English. And then you have to give, and then you, there's an eye on the translation and, um, the tra- this translation is very blunt. I have to say that, but it, I mean, it could be that it's just a good translation, and that's the way uh, Han, Han Kang meant it written. Now, I read another short story of Han Kang's, which I'm, um, which I'm not really going to talk about here. Um, like forty pages in, uh, I had to find it in a um, like a dual language Korean English book. So obviously, I, I'm not reading the Korean, but I read the short story, and, and it had the very dry bluntness that this that the vegetarian has, and it was by a different. Um, translator so so what you get here is you get like this feel for korean wording which i like which is the reason really the reason i i read these books is like to get those little pieces of culture you know to get like this high level writing like writer with thoughts and and asking questions and, and making me think about society or the way i live or the way i see things you know and uh and you really do get both one of the things that that stuck out to me was um, was the way that the translator decided not to decided just to be okay to, to say brother in law and sister in law meaning meaning in in Korean it was it's clearly a pronoun and if you wanted to to translate this translate this so that it was like oh the way Americans or British people talk you know we we never call each other hey brother in law. What are you doing? Hey, sister-in-law, my sister-in-law, are you going to go get a plate of food? You know, so the, the translator chose to keep that, even though it was this awkward phrasing. But if you're reading this and you're uh, a native English speaker from, you know, a lot of, a lot of native English speakers across the world, if you're reading it, 
you do you 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 keep the feeling that you're in a different culture, you know. And then obviously there's other ways the way that you know the way that she describes things around and the names and stuff that keep you in that culture. But the it was a good decision by the translator in my mind to keep some of those those studs instead of just rewriting the sentence so that you can use the he or she pronoun. Um, some of the other things that that I saw that was very Korean or or at least you know wouldn't make sense from the eyes of a of an American reader so much is is like a mother and father disowning their child, which I didn't look into this and I don't know that you can do that 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 happens all the time. But the mother and father the father especially especially was so distraught by her choice that uh, in that third chapter, the father just disowns her. Doesn't the, the family doesn't talk to her? They don't worry about her. They don't visit her. They don't take care of their daughter that has a mental problem. So, so that you know that's something that that comes out that there's still that sort of status with father, father and and mother. And you see it too with um, with the parents in the beginning of the book apologizing to the husband and. Presumably they had been married for a while and they lived together, but if like my wife acted up or something, I don't see her parents like apologizing to me necessarily that they're so embarrassed and it's like a, a shame on their family or something. Um, you know, especially over like she just decided not to eat meat, even if it is a big meat eating culture, you know, so, so that's the piece where you read and you just see that. But the book is very Korean. It's not trying to be written or be adapted in some other way, right? Like The Office, oh, that's been adapted in many languages. That, that TV show has been adapted in many languages, and it's, it's about an office. So all that you do is just go, okay, now it's an English office uh, or an American office or a German office. There's versions of that show everywhere where this book... You know, it's sort of built into the book, the actual culture and and, and what Han Kang knows, you know. But against that, the fact that that's there, I think, has led many uh, reviewers and readers to think that the book is about Korean culture and and some of the passivity and the and the basically the hierarchy that's built in and the. The way I see that is, I mean, you can read, normally for these books, I'll have a section where I talk about critics, and I'm not now, uh, just because I can't cite all the sources, but you'll read, you're, if you read the reviews on this book, they, pretty much people have started to believe that the book is a uh, a statement against hierarchy in, in Korean culture, and during an interview, during her uh, short interview on NPR, um... The uh, the NPR announcer actually asked her that, and her her English is pretty good. I think um, she actually studied uh, with a Iowa writers group and stuff, but she's mostly, of course, in Korea uh, and very Korean. Um, so she she's on this radio show with NPR. It's a really short. You can probably Google and find it, or I'll put it in the show notes. And and they go, you know, the radio. The radio personality basically asks her what all the reviewers and everyone's saying about it. Is that, oh, it's a statement against Korean hierarchy. As if all this stuff in Korea, everyone's making a statement and that's what gets translated here. There's so few Korean books translated, right, that aren't like uh, sort of Korean manga, essentially. And she goes, she's very meek and she says outright, like, no, I think there's a more, she wanted, she's trying to express a more human element. You know, and, and I think maybe some of our, like, just our natural Anglo narrow-mindedness, narrow-mindedness may not allow us to see that. Because if you read, if you're Korean and you read this book, it's that's just normal life. There's no statement about it. She just writes it as if it's normal life. I don't think a Korean would go, oh, this is a statement against uh, the hierarchy in our culture and... And some of the, some issues with equality, you know, or whatever, whatever some of these writers thought. And uh, she says it outright, basically, and that was a short interview, and she goes, you know, she mentioned it was about violence, and at that time, I still I still don't really get it. When I read the book, it, it was this, to me, it was, I was more about the style of the writing and, and some of the choices in, in the structure, which I'll talk about in a second, and I didn't really get it, and I didn't get it either 
in that interview after I'd read the book when she goes, it was more about violence. And there's a much longer interview with her that's in Korean and subtitled, uh, which I'll also put in the, uh, in the show notes. And, uh, she was able to expand on, on what it is about violence. And a lot of people, a lot of people haven't caught on to this. If you read some of the good reads, for example, reviews, uh, which, which I like to read afterwards just to see what, you know, if people thought the way I thought, especially after I write notes for one of these, I'll, I'll go in there and read them. And, uh, and there was a lot, there was a lot of that idea rehashed that it was about hierarchy and Korean culture and those kind of issues rather than something about human brutality, which she gets in in a lot of detail as far as what it's about. It's about human brutality and the idea that violence, you basically have to be violent to live if you're going to be a human to some extent, you know, and then there's also a lot of focus on it being about vegetarianism when, you know, that's just a mode uh, to explain, you know, just to basically ask the question. There's no solution to it. It's obvious that we have to be violent. You're going to have to eat something. You got to eat meat. If you don't eat meat, you know, you're still killing plants, basically. Uh, and then culture might become violent against you. So, I mean, she it's basically how uh, this woman becomes like the incredible, the incredible protester against human brutality. And she's very clear about that. If you, if you look into it and then it gets, it's extremely obvious to, you know, if you didn't pick that up, which I didn't. And, and then you hear her talk about it. Um, uh, so even though, and then when you read it, the book's not about someone being a vegetarian, which seems to be the topic a lot. Um, even for Han Kang, she says, Hey, you know, I was vegetarian for some of the same reasons. And, and that now she eats some meat only for health reasons, et cetera, et cetera. But, but you know that that's just a vehicle for this idea of, of what human brutality is and, and how necessary it is in life, not only to be human, just in life in general, in out in the wild, lions and whatnot. There's a, a need for violence, essentially, to, to live on. And, and as conscious human beings is the only thing with at least our level of consciousness, you know, it's, it's sort of amazing. We don't like violence. We're against it. We've created governments to supposedly protect us and be violent other places, uh, to keep violence away from us, to keep war away from us or whatnot. But it's still completely necessary on some level to be violent, to live. And I think it's a, I think it's a real good question and it almost sounds a little bit basic, right? Like, of course it is. But, you know, here's a woman that rejects it and she's legitimately crazy. She becomes crazy and probably you and I would too if we tried to completely reject any kind of violence, you know, and some of it doesn't even get talked about, you know, there's, you know, there's death around us all the time, whether it's an insect or bacteria or the chicken you eat. Um, so... So I just really wanted to compare those two, those two things. That's actually two themes where you actually do get a taste of Korea in there. Like the way a Korean thinks and talks, the way the society works, you know. But people got a little bit too focused on that. And there is a more human level to it. There's a higher level that's not about uh, the social sociopolitical situation in Korea, but really some deeper... Um, like, I don't want to say literal, but, you know, when the questions that uh, great writers can ask to make you think about. So some deep themes just basically in the literature. So um, so those those are two big themes. The next piece that I want to talk about, and it's the, the thing that uh, I noticed as I was reading the book more, the, vi- the understanding sort of the human brutality and violence came a little bit later. Um, in my early notes on the book, you know, I was, I was a little bit, I wasn't sure how to think about the book cause I knew I enjoyed it, but I hadn't be, been able to really, uh, really let it sit on me and, and see how it, it affected the way I think or, or how it will affect the way I think in the future. So initially what got me about the book is really just the some of the writing choices and the design. Now she has a very, like a very Amy, I don't know that much about Amy Hempel. I've only read, uh, 
her book of short stories and there's a novella in there. I can't remember what it's called, but a very show don't tell style, which I know is a cliche for writing. Oh, you should show, but not tell. Uh, but I, and Amy Hempel, I remember being a very, uh, very like sh- a lot of brevity in her stories. They were very short stories. And even her novella was short. And so that's what the vegetarian felt like is that three short stories sort of about the same thing right, with the same protagonist that was never a narrator, and brought together. So the show Don't Tell is very clear here. Um, So you you get that feeling, you mix that in with the fact that uh, it's a very short book. You'll get, if you wanted to, you can get through it in a day. It's only 200 pages. Um, But then it's three very long chapters, right? So you you got to be in for the long haul as far as the thought process of the narrator and and the way the story's paced and then you get the second narrator and the time never overlaps right so everything that happened through the first narrator is told and then it's a little bit farther down the timeline and you get the brother-in-law and and then you have another large book and you your your mind essentially resets even though you were still talking about uh young he or the protagonist, it's it's a new way of looking at things, it's new uh, wants and needs from the narrator, it's a new viewpoint from the narrator between the husband, the brother-in-law, and the sister, and it's a different point in, in the protagonist's um, basically protest against human brutality, right? So that's what I got as I was reading it, is... Uh, the structure of the book, like the technical writing was very good. I'll, I'll often, like if you listen to hip hop, which maybe is a little bit weird for a lot of you that uh, would read this kind of book, but sometimes you're looking at like how technical the rapper is, right? And the way he, the way his, his bars go, if he's fitting a lot of stuff in, how melodic, how he works melody in, um, uh, the amount of syllables he works in, in every beat and whether that, you know, how that changes and how interesting the actual rhymes are, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so the book is very technical in that sense where it's very planned out and and she has a sort of structure that um she gets A pluses for me and essentially uh in the way that this story can be told. So she could have just told it as as uh, it could have just been about human brutality and you could have had like the omniscient narrator. But there's a lot of style. Uh, there's a lot of elements of style. Not a cliche, but a great book, right? There's a lot of... Uh, her, her elements of style are very clear because of the way she's decided to tell the story in a, in a tight timeline um, with three different narrators at different pieces of that timeline. And that's what, that's what struck me the biggest in it is that it was also told in a very, very technical, very technical, interesting way. And it made me at least outright think about, you know, how she could, she tells this story about human brutality or at the time I just thought, you know, a crazy person. Um, and, uh, and the way that it just could have been told with omniscient narrator, or she could have chose to keep the, the, the sister throughout because the sister's in it throughout, and we could have heard more about, you know, how the sister felt about the hus- her husband cheating on her with her, or, or the different choices that could have made in, be made in the style. And I think she gets A pluses across. It was a great decision uh, in the way it was presented um, in the the cups of each narrator along that timeline, uh, and then also the feel for. So not a lot of books are written where it's just a very short book, but. Ex- you know, three extremely long chapters. There's essentially three extremely long uh, short stories. So um, we're going to wrap it up here pretty soon, but there are a couple other themes. This is more like a discussion topic theme, uh, these next few here. Uh, so there's a big... So in the book, there's, you know, in a 200-page book, there's two divorces. One because one person's crazy, and one because one person is taking advantage of that crazy person, or... I shouldn't say crazy, but mentally ill, uh, and a lot of unhappy relationships in it. So you get this when you when you watch the interviews with Han Kang. If you decide to do that, you know you she comes off very meek, and I don't know if that's just like a you know a culture comparing it to herself, but she's very quiet and very meek, 
and um, I was happy that the uh, the longer interview was just her talking and and no reviewer were in the other one she was you know crushed by the announcers a lot and and talked over a little bit so where she just gets talking you see that she's very quiet and meek but there is this theme of divorce and unhappy relationships in there which I don't know I don't know what you know I don't know if that's a like a piece of her herself basically cuz you see the pieces of herself as far as the K- Korean culture goes and things that we talked about earlier but you also see um it in her because she had tried to be vegetarian in her own past and then sort of wrote the story, wrote a story about a wife actually becoming a plant, almost like, I guess there's a short story that I haven't been able to read, but uh, a wife actually becoming a plant in the sense of like metamorphosis, Kafka's metamorphosis. And that, the idea from that story, you know, she moved it sort of over to here, except in something more reality based. So you get these things a lot of divorce, the unhappy relationships in the, in the story. And then, uh, and then, uh, the main males in the story are extremely having, you know, they're definitely the bad guys, the husband, the brother-in-law and the father are definitely the bad guys where, um, uh, where, uh, young, his sister is very much a good guy. You know, she's d- doesn't really get to understand her sister, but she comes the closest, you know. And so, so I think I'll expand on that more as I read more of Han Kang's books. She has a, a new book that's just released, um, and I read that short story. So maybe in the future, we'll I'll review this on, on sort of her outlook. It could just be it was in this book. But um, definitely the pure antagonists have been male or males in this book. And there is a, a real melancholy theme of divorce and, and unhappy relationships. Um, and, uh, and then just the last, the last like discussion point I'd throw out there, uh, that would interest me is just how f- focused everyone is on the fact that the book is called the vegetarian. And in the first few pages, even though it's sort of irrelevant, you know, the tool, she uses, uh, to talk about human brutality, how focused everyone is, is that she is a vegetarian. And in a lot of the interviews and a lot of the reading and a lot of the, the comments, uh, like on Goodreads, like I mentioned earlier, they're talking about vegetarianism. Uh, one of the guys I follow, it's an extremely prolific writer on Goodreads, you know, goes, this book really hit me because I'm a vegetarian. And then he talked about it, which is fine. If that's like your, what you got from the book. But if I were a vegetarian, you know, I would feel like this book was not about me at all, you know, and and not about any piece of the fight of being a vegetarian or any of the weirdness of, of living in a culture as a vegetarian. Like it really is a vehicle to start her off towards a, a path of, of insanity. And then from a, from a writer's point of view to expose the way human brutality is necessary to live, you know? And so all the focus on vegetarianism from this book, you know, sort of throws me off. Like it, it's interesting that it gets talked about so much from people that have actually read the book. So I don't know what you guys might think of those. Um, but those are some of the sub discussion topics that, uh, I'd, uh, I'd like to expand on, you know, obviously I expanded on, on the bigger stuff just now. Um, so anyway, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up. Normally this part, I would talk about what critics have said. I know in the, um, in, uh, the movie one in the movie podcast, I I definitely did that. And there's a lot of good, there's actually a lot of good critique out there that, that I had notes on. I may do a separate podcast just about the critique. Um, and it, it sort of, uh, responds to some of the things I've said here and, and, and how it's made me rethink the book and a little more on Han, Han Kang and, and what she says about it. But I may not. So I just wanted to get one out there, make sure that uh, I set the I set the stage for how I want this the propaganda show to be. Basically, these like PBS style things, which are or which are the first three podcasts out there, and then a little more, you know, wildness and fun and 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 geekiness and stuff. Hey guys, uh, thanks for listening. If you do listen to this, uh, I want to hear your opinion. Your opinion, you can uh, you can initiate contact with me at Chris Sarda 
uh, on Twitter. Um, and I, uh, I definitely want to hear what you thought about it and, uh, where you would go with it. And if you, and if you thought the book was good enough to continue reading her, because I'm definitely going to read, uh, her next book. The name slips my mind, the human something. I didn't have that in front of me. Um, thanks for listening guys at Chris Sarda on Twitter. And thank you for listening to the propaganda show.